Hey everybody, thanks for being here. The Reese Motivation Profile Explained with Jonathan Peters. Hey, normally this would be a good time for me to introduce myself, say why you should listen to me, but believe me, in just a couple minutes, you are going to learn so much about me, not just under my accomplishments, you're going to learn what motivates me. So if I were your target audience, if I were your target client, you would know exactly what to say, how to say it to get me to take action. So the point is, this is not about me. It's about this guy, Dr. Stephen Reese, whose amazing study has unlocked what makes us individuals, what motivates us, what causes us to make the decisions that we make, take the actions that we take, and ultimately, why do we enjoy what we enjoy? So this really isn't about me at all. In fact, it is really about you, who you are, why you do what you do, why you make the decisions you make, and why you enjoy what you enjoy. So to really explain things, I want to take you all the way back to caveman days. So as humans were developing language, we were now suddenly able to describe our surroundings. We were also able to pass on our knowledge to other folks, other generations, other people within our tribe. So if I discovered something like, say, fire, I could teach you how to also make fire. If I found out that this plant was good and this one was poisonous, this one gave you a stomach ache and so on, I could share this information with other folks. Now, a lot of what we were engaged in as cavemen was trying to figure out our surroundings to try and make sense of what was around us. And so to do that, we started to categorize things. So for instance, a parent might teach a child that saber-toothed tiger is bad, therefore all saber-toothed tigers are bad. So therefore, when the child sees a saber-toothed tiger or anything that looks like a saber-toothed tiger, the child will run away, will hide or do whatever is necessary to survive. And so what we did as a species is we began to categorize things. We began to categorize things. Tigers, bad. This berry, bad. This fire, hot, don't touch it. And so certain things were categorized. For instance, we noticed that there were certain anatomical differences between different types of people. There was that person over there, and there was this person over here, and they had different body parts, and so we separated the group according to those body parts. So we've had men and women. And then what we began to do is assign roles to these different folks. So over here, women, this was their job. Over here, men, this was their job. And then we assigned them certain characteristics. This is how women behave. This is how men behave. And then we began to notice that there were different generations. The old people behaved young, differently than young people. And, and then we even divided it up from there. We realized that our tribe was different than that tribe over there. Maybe they look different than us. Maybe their hair is different. Their language is probably different. Uh, they have different rituals, different ceremonies. Uh, they decorate their bodies differently. So in our efforts to categorize our surroundings and make sense of this chaotic world that we were in, we began to place people in different categories. That's a woman, that's a man, that's an old person, that's a young person, that's our tribe, those people over there are from that tribe, so totally different from us. We created all these different categories, but very quickly we found out that things don't fit nicely into categories. Not all women behave this way. Not all men behave this way. Not all women think this way. Not all men think this way. And so this, these differences began to show up and it, we realized our categories were pretty limiting. So at night, we noticed that stars moved throughout the skies and, and we could predict the seasons coming based on the movement of the stars. And so we began to associate things that were happening here on Earth which what, with things that were happening up in the heavens. 
And so we placed great meaning on the stars up in the sky. And so when we begin to look at the differences in people, we begin to notice certain commonalities with when they were born. And so we developed this thing called astrology. So if someone were born in this month, they might have the characteristics of a bull. And someone born in this month might be more like a fish in the water. And someone over here might be a lion. And so we begin to associate differences in people with when they were born, what moons and, and what times of year they were born. Of course, the Chinese had a different system. They took the whole lunar year. And again, the problem comes in is that people don't fit nicely into these t into these categories. Not all Virgos act this way. Not all Leos act this way. Not all people born in a certain year act this way. There's still some variances. There's still some differences. So in the traditional astrology, we had to add other elements like rising suns and setting suns and how the stars were moving, what was in retrograde and so on. Uh, the Chinese, they would add in other things like metal and colors. So even if you're born in the same year as me, you might be a different metal than me. You might be a different color. So I'm a red iron horse. You might be a a blue wood horse. So even though we're in the same category, we still have differences. So this went on for a little while till the ancient Greeks came along and this guy called Hippocrates. And Hippocrates said, you know what, this is silly, all this stuff looking at the stars and looking out at these animals and so on. He said, really, humans, everything is inside of humans. We're the peak of creation. And so if we just look inside our bodies, we can come up with categorizing folks. And so he used blood, phlegm, and black and yellow bile. So body fluids with inside the body explain categories. And this worked really well for the Greeks because they liked squares. Because all the sides are equal, the angles are all equal. Four being an important number, four being uh, two plus two is four, two times two is four is this sort of magical number for the ancient Greeks. So they liked this concept of quadrants and then began to place people inside these quadrants. And the theory, Hippocrates, being the, the great physician that he was, the theory was if you had a lot of blood in you, you would behave a certain way. If you had a lot of black bile in you, you would behave a certain way. If you were low in yellow bile, you would behave in a different manner. And so that's what he did. He began to associate all these different characteristics in people according to this nice little quadrant system that he came up with. Aristotle came along, he wasn't too sure about this whole phlegm stuff, but it still worked. And so he also propagated this idea of phlegm and bile and blood and the different categories of people. Of course, the Chinese created a more complicated system with the I Ching because quadrants were much too simple for them. And this whole I Ching thing that they could classify people inside of. So this went on for quite a while, for centuries. So along came this guy named Carl Jung, and he began to theorize about people's minds and their brains and why they did what they did. And so he created this concept of the supraconscious. Instead of everything being inside of us as individuals, maybe we were appealing to something much larger than us. So this consciousness that was above all humans. And there were certain archetypes that were inside of this. And so he took the ancient Greek force system and said, and modified it just a little bit, he said people generally exist inside of one of these archetypical quadrants. Catherine Briggs was a student of Carl Jung, and so she and her daughter, uh, Isabel, created this system of categorizing people inside this quadrant, okay, inside of Jungian mysticism, going back to uh, Hippocrates and Aristotle, and begin to place people in these different quadrants. Now this is back in 1954 when they came out with what, what became known as the Myers-Briggs profile. Now it didn't catch on in the 1950s. It really didn't get any legs until the real the New Age movement started spiking up in the 1980s. Carl Jung came back in fashion. Joseph Campbell was around and people began to talk about archetypes again. And then this profile emerged. Again, 
The problem is people didn't fit nicely into a group. And if you've ever gone through, say, a Myers-Briggs thing or a description, you're able to say, yeah, th that person over there is a sanguine and that person over there is a choleric, but I don't fit nicely into phlegmatic. I'm kind of phlegmatic, but I have characteristics of a melancholy. And so even inside the system, we found that people like astrology didn't fit nicely. So what the Myers-Briggs folks did is there on the left, they put a quadrant inside of a quadrant. Right? So they complicated things a little bit. Uh, more recently, some folks, what's interesting, went back to kind of something that looks like the I Ching to explain how we're not all in all the way in one category. We can move over to another one. Or you might be familiar with something like DISC, very, very popular. And what it did though is said, well, people don't fit nicely into a category. They have percentages of different categories. So you might be 34% in this one, 46 over here, three down here, and 17% over there. Again, it feels right, it seems right, lots of observation, and there's great profiles to say you're a percentage of this, a percentage of that. Why? Because we don't fit nicely into these squares. And then other industries, other categories have caught on to this, so we have different, let's say, player types. If you think of games, there's the socialites, the killers, the achievers, the explorers, and so on. So we keep creating all these categories. But let me ask you a question. What if, we did it the other way around. What if instead of generalizing and categorizing people, we approached it from a different direction? And for this, I'm gonna to turn to Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. If you haven't had a chance to see his TED Talk on the Golden Circle, highly, highly recommend that you do. In the Golden Circle, he says, what makes individuals very powerful, what makes uh, organizations powerful, is they understand their why. Most organizations know what their what, few of them know their how, very few of them know their why. Why are they steadfast? Why are they melancholy? Why are they phlegmatic? On the, on the gamification side of things or the gaming side of things, why are they a socializer? Why are they a killer? So this is what we're looking at is why do people behave in a way that they are categorized this, in this manner? And so for this, that's where we're going to turn to Dr. Stephen Reese, and he asked, what motivates you? Now he's coming at this from a very, very scientific, academic, scholarly point of view. See, the other systems are all based on observation. The stars are doing th were doing this when this kid was born and he behaved this way. They have a lot of bile in them, therefore they're this. Again, we're, the other systems are looking at the what people do and how they want to communicate. So how they communicate is, becomes important based on observation. Not scientific, not scientific at all. See, Dr. Stephen Reese said, well, why not ask people why they do what they do? So the initial study, over 80,000 people across four continents, and he just started asking. Started asking, he got over 500 initial, what he called, motivators. He was able to whittle those down to over 300. Okay, these two are similar when someone says this and someone else says this, those are similar. Then he took his everything and pushed it into a computer, ran a bunch of algorithms, and he came up with 15 core needs. A little later, after some scientific argument, the 16th one was added. So we now have 16 core needs. There's been dozens, probably over 100 at this time, uh, peer-reviewed articles. And his profile and versions of this profile are used as a predictor of behavior in clinical trials, as well as by the military. Uh, the military uses it to predict who will suffer for, from post-traumatic stress syndrome. The point is, is once we understand their why, their core whys, now we can determine what types of behaviors that are likely to occur. So this is pretty cool stuff. Now, instead of observing all these different behaviors, why not take a step back and say, why do people behave this way? Why are they in this quadrant? Why are they in this section of the quadrant? Why do they have 34 of this and 10 of these? Why are they an achiever, a killer? Why does a Taurus behave a certain way? Okay, so instead of observing, what if we got down to why these, these behaviors come into play? Now I want to be clear here. 
I'm not putting down these other systems. A lot of observation has gone on for decades, if not centuries, all right? There's thousands, if not millions of people that have gone through some sort of profile based on the Myers-Briggs. So whether disc, Myers-Briggs, any of the other colors, animals, it's not that these are wrong from the Reese motivational profile standpoint. We're, what we're asking is why does somebody fit into this category? Why do they display these characteristics? Why do they look like a dominance? Why do they look like a phlegmatic? Why do they look like a Taurus? And so this is what we're asking from the Reese motivational profile perspective. This is what makes it different. Instead of categorizing people, we say, why does an individual fit into this category? So when you take the, the Reese Motivational Profile, you'll get something that looks like this. This is my profile, and like I promised, you now know some things that are very, very core to who I am. You're going to have to do a little bit more studying to, to learn about what uh, all, the, all of this means. But what's important here to realize, that middle section is average. So when you get this, your profile back, you will have a lot of things that are average coming down through the yellow section. So your average among the, of whatever, hundreds of thousands of people who have gone through this profile at this point. So that's where you'll be average like other people. On the green side, that's where you have more of a desire than average. On the red side, that's where you have less of a desire than average. Okay, so very quickly, if you look down there at social contact, someone who's high social contact with me wants more social contact than normal. You might be low social contact. So let's say society says that we have eight hours of contact with people. So while we're at work, we have eight hours of contact. Now for me, that's not enough. I want more than eight hours of contact with folks. You might be low social contact, meaning while you're at work, you want to be left alone. You don't want people talking to you, bugging you. You want to be in your little cubicle, your little office with the door shut, left alone. Okay, so it's not right or wrong. These are just differences between us. So most of you taking this profile, you will not be as extreme as what you're seeing here. This is my profile. Uh, I am not normal. And some of you know me. Some of you will get to know me. And you'll say, yeah, that's very, very true. <laughs> All right. So I want to be very clear. When you get your profile, it's based on the average among the populations that have been studied. Now, what can you do with this? Well, now what we can do is we can begin to compare different folks and we can anticipate where there's likely to be conflicts. So for instance, one organization that I'm a part of, we have three principles here, three principles from the organization, and we can quickly go down through here and see where we're likely to have conflict, where we might be different. So if someone's like far on the left and two others are on the right, that's gonna be a point of conflict. But what we can also do, and this is what's key here, is assign certain roles to certain people. So for instance, if we were to take this company, we go to the bottom line there, vengeance. Okay, Vengeance is the need to win, the need to take revenge, but certainly the need to win. You see the two folks on the left are lower than average vengeance. They're nice. The downside with them is they don't need to dominate the market. They would gladly help the competition. If someone doesn't fit, well, let's send them over to the competition. Meanwhile, the guy on the right there, happens to be me, right, is on the higher side of vengeance, at least according to this organization. So maybe you would put this person in charge of marketing, of sales, of brand development, of making sure that this company is prominent in the marketplace. Okay, so again, the beauty of this profile is not that we're in categories. These are three very, very specific individuals. Two of them might fit into a similar quadrant in the quadrant system, but here, very, very different. Let's take it a step further. What if you could know everybody in your department? What if you could look at the whole group of people and anticipate where there's likely to be conflicts? where there's likely to be agreement, 
where uh, we are on track, we could assign certain tasks to different folks. Now, this looks really confusing as it is here. And of course, when I work with organizations, what we do is we put this all in a spreadsheet. And, and so it's much more readable. But you can begin to see the differences. These are not categories. People are not fitting nicely into different squares. But from this, we can look at a market. We can look at a group. We can look at... A, our employees who our target markets are and so on we have a lot of options now because we know what motivates them we know their core why that will create the how that will create the what so this is the power of what you're about to get into now here's where we start because some of you'll be saying wow that's my, my company's too large uh, this is going to take too much time we got to roll this out what's the cost and so on at the bare minimum at the bare minimum, you want to know your blind spots. You want to know your blind spots. See, Dr. Reese said this. He says, not only do we think everybody should be like us, but that they are like us. I make the assumption because this is so core to my why, I assume that your why is very, very similar to mine. And it's not. As you can see, I'm very far off average here. So what happens is, is that if we are oppositely motivated, okay, so if we go down to expedient, okay, you'll see that's the third one where I'm all the way on the right, and you are low expedient, what's going to happen is we're going to have very different relationships to rules, to traditions. I'm going to assume that everybody breaks the speed limit. I'm going to assume that if someone says, well, this is the way we've always done it, that that's a reason not to do it that way. Okay, so you and I will do things differently, we will make decisions differently, and we will judge each other as wrong. Okay, so that's where the blind spots come in. Or let's say I'm your target audience, I'm your target customer, let's say. And what you're wanting to sell me is, let's say, insurance. Very, very easy insurance here. Well, if you came to me and you kept talking about family and children and so on, you can look at my profile here and know very, very quickly, I don't care about heirs. I don't care about passing on to the next generation. I don't have children. I don't particularly like children. I'm low motivated by family. It's not right or wrong. It's just different. So now instead of trying to sell me based on family or try to persuade me to take action based on family, now you can work with some, what is important to me or jump down further. See savings, right? I have never enjoyed savings. I've never gotten any joy. My only regrets on life is what I have not purchased. Right? So if you're wanting to change my behavior, you can't do it by extolling the value of savings and the, and the virtue of savings. What other motivators are here that you could appeal to to get me to set aside money to invest in your fund. Once we understand our blind spots, now we can begin to work with others' blind spots. So I'm just using myself as an example. If you're high savings and I'm low savings, we have you have a huge blind spot when it comes to uh, communicating with me. Of course, I have huge blind spots, as you can see. And again, if you as you interact with me, you could also anticipate, now that you've looked at this, my profile here, you can anticipate where my blind spots are. And we can work together. Uh, you could be persuasive. You might even be manipulative now that you have all this great information. But at the very least, you'll have this knowledge about yourself. And then when you shore up your blind spots, you will be better able to communicate with others, with those in your family, those at work, those in your target audience. So now's the time to click on the link, get your profile. It's 128 questions. You could get through it in maybe 20 minutes. It doesn't take a lot of time. In fact, you don't want to take a lot of time. Once that profile comes out, we'll get on the phone together, communicate in some way, and begin to talk about your profile. What makes you who you are? Why do you do what you do? But more importantly, what are your blind spots? What are your blind spots? And how can we use this understanding to better communicate with those we're wanting to lead, with our target audiences, with our customers and our prospects. 
So you have this great opportunity to not only get some great insight into you as an individual, but also how you relate to other folks, whether it's average people, maybe even people on your team, you can begin to relate with them. Then with this knowledge, you can communicate better, you can be more persuasive, ultimately, you can be more successful by understanding your own profile. I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the opportunity to work with you. And I'm excited with where you are going with this new understanding. Again, my name is Jonathan Peters, and we will be in touch.